Do we have, Tina, do we have any public comment? Madam Chair, uh, Council Member Albritton is going to lead the invocation and the pledge. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Please stand. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Uh, now, and now, Tina, do we have citizens to be heard? Yes, Madam Chair. Would you like to do introductions before or after citizens to be heard? After. We have David Ballard Geddes, Jr., Madam. Mm -hmm. Hi, good afternoon. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. I usually focus in on the water supply, how we got where we are, the perfidiousness of why the water is in such a contaminated disarray, and who stands to benefit or profit from such deliberate calamity. Today, I would like to talk about a similar scenario unfolding with our public transportation <laughs> resulting from the proactive under planning of our roadways to our outdated, overspent, cumbersome busing system, providing that our bus stops are frequently under engineered, the neglect of needed shelter from the rain and the sunshine, neglecting garbage cans, neglecting necessary shoulders and turnoff lanes for the ease of road congestion and safety while boarding and offloading. Many of the residents can't afford both a place to live and an automobile at the same time. Maybe that's the objective. So they ride the bus or an electric bicycle to work while they smile on their faces like Pee Wee Herman did on his way to Walt Disney. And it's true, I don't like carnies because of their subversive, cunning nature to covet and undermine the welfare of others, but they are smart in their methods and their doing of things. The tram system at Walt Disney used for public transportation is our answer for practical transportation needs moving the public. The tram used at Walt Disney is economical and efficient. The tram system is maneuverable in a parking lot as well as on the streets. The tram system at Walt Disney can be adjusted to fit any size of ridership. It's easy to board and offload. We seem to be spending our wheels, wasting a lot of time and money on our public transportation needs when Walt Disney has had that right there for us to look at for decades. I suggest we start moving in that direction. Thank you. Anyone else, Tina? No, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. And just for uh, the record, can we start over here with Councillor Knapp and go around the room and, and just introduce yourself quickly? Vice Mayor Andrew Knapp of the City of Oldsmar. Vice Mayor Chris Burke, City of Seminole, representing the inland communities. Council Member Gina Driscoll, representing PSTA. Vice Mayor Eric Girard, City of Largo. Dave Eggers, Pinellas County Commissioner. Dave Albritton, Council Member, City of Clearwater. Whit Blanton, your Executive Director. Julie, Julie Ward Bajalski, Mayor of the Great City of Dunedin. Brian Scott, Pinellas County Commission. Council Member Mohammed, City of St. Petersburg, District 7. And Vice Mayor Patty Reed from the City of Pinellas Park. 
Uh, Richie Floyd, City Council Member from St. Petersburg, District 8. Mike Eisner, Vice Mayor of Tarpon Springs, soon to be hopefully appointed. <laughs> And, and uh, Commissioner Eisner is uh, non-voting for this meeting, but he's a welcome guest at the, at the dais. Thank you, appreciate it. And I'm Janet Long, uh, County Commission, and your chair. All right, so um, Whit, do you wanna welcome back our new principal planner? I do. Um, Rodney gave you uh, a little bit of a heads up during the workshop, but I'd like to ask Nasheen to come up to the podium just for a second and um, just uh, recognize her. We are very, very pleased to have her come back. And she got a year worth of transportation planning training too in the private sector. So um, she will be taking on a new role as special projects and grants and partnerships principal planner. And um, you're such a cohesive part of the team. We're thrilled. So Yay. welcome back, Nisheen. Welcome back. Thank you and good luck to you, Nosheen. I'd also like to take this opportunity to welcome our newest board member from the city of Oldsmar, Vice Mayor Andrew Knapp. And uh, we got a little introduction uh, to you in the workshop. I wondered if you wanted to just say a minute or two about why you're interested in being on this board and what you look forward to doing. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, again, Vice Mayor Andrew Knapp, city of Oldsmar. I've been representing our city up there for the last four years now. And transportation is definitely something of interest to me. Uh, as I mentioned in our workshop earlier, I've been keenly aware and, and staying on top of what's going on as far as technology goes. I have an engineering background. I work for a manufacturer up in Oldsmar. And so we, we just always are dealing with growth from the business perspective. And I know how that impacts transportation and our work centers that are out there. So really looking forward to being involved in this board uh, taking the place of Jared Buckman who served for the last year or so up here uh, on behalf of the city of Oldsmar and looking forward to doing some good work and making some progress. Thank you. All right, and now we are on consent. Is there anyone who wants to pull anything from the consent calendar? Anything? No? May I have a... Okay, it's been moved by Commissioner Scott, second by... Second. By Commissioner Eggers. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, and... We have a public hearing item. I'm going to make your jobs a little easier today um, because two of our public hearings have changed. Uh, the MPO public hearing item, we've been informed uh, as of a day or two ago that the department does not need to amend the transportation improvement program. So we're going to move on past that and go on to the Pinellas Planning Council items, if that's all right. Okay. Countywide plan map amendments. We'll have Emma Winnick come up and address this one. We had a second case that is being continued to March, so we just have the one case for Pinellas County today. Wait, I just wanna make sure that you all understand we need a vote to continue to a date certain on the continuing case for Tarpon Springs. Okay, we'll take that up after this one. Yep, this is the only case we heard today and that com comes from Pinellas County. It is a 3.4 acre site it's located at 3720 and 3730 Tampa Road in Palm Harbor. And the existing countywide plan map category is preservation and office. And the proposed countywide plan map category is public semi-public. There is an existing beauty salon and office. And the desire is to be able to construct additional building square footage on the property. So we have a location map showing the subject area as well as the jurisdiction map. Surrounding uses, so it's basically surrounded by multifamily on all sides and there is a wetland directly um, to the southwest there as well. So this is depicting what the change would look like on our countywide plan map. So as you can see, it is office and preservation, and it would be going to public semi-public. It is along a scenic non-commercial corridor of Tampa Road there that is a residential corridor, and the public semi-public category is considered a consistent use within the countywide rules. 
along the residential scenic non-commercial corridor. So the max index score, um, this grid cell has a 4.5 scoring on the max index, which is below the countywide average. However, the countywide rules do allow us to consider other factors when determining the, if the requested amendment would meet the relevant countywide considerations when looking at the max index score. And when reviewing this, we did have some considerations that we felt deemed this proposed amendment appropriate and that it satisfied the overall um, intent. And the main ones being that the volume and capacity ratio is 0.712. It does have a level service grade of C. And also the transportation improvement program does include a trail construction project in 2025 that is located on the adjacent grid cell to the east. So therefore that score will be raised due to that project. So overall, the requested amendment to public semi-public would permit a wide range of institutional and transportation utility uses. The public semi-public designation is considered a consistent use along that residential scenic non-commercial corridor. And although the max index score is below the countywide average, we feel we can support the amendment due, the, due to the considerations of additional multimodal factors. And so we do find the amendment consistent and we recommend approval. Do we have any questions for that case? Commissioner Burke. What happens to the preservation portion of the lot? Yep, so there is basically why it's showing up as preservation on our map is because there was, it's all upland portion. Um, none of the actual wetland is within the preservation line that's being amended. Um, and there was a discrepancy between the uh, local map and ours basically just included the buffer, um, whereas theirs did not. Follow up. So would they be able to build on that preservation land now if it's changed? I think with this change they would be able to, although I believe that they sent us, or they noted that there's no plans at this time to be developed within the wetland area. And like I said, it is all buffer and upland at this time, yeah. Any other questions for me? Any further questions? No? Okay. And now on case number two, that is being... Con oh. Madam Chair, before you take the vote, I just want to let you know that we do have Todd Pressman here wishing to address the board on this case. Well, I didn't see him. I'm so sorry. Where is... Oh, behind the pillar. Good afternoon, Todd. Please come forward. Thank you, Madam Chair and board members. Todd Pressman, 200 2nd Avenue South, number 451 in St. Petersburg. I'll keep this very short. Uh, through the many hearings up to this date, we've had zero opposition. Uh, we have were originally in for a different zoning and amendment, uh, and then working with the Pinellas County staff we came back and revised it to what you see before you. So we wanted to be within parameters of the Pinellas County staff. Uh, and then coming forward, uh, Pinellas County staff has supported, obviously, Board of County Commissioners have passed it along. The uh, PAC voted unanimously in support. Uh, so with that very good history of all green lights, we appreciate your consideration. Thank you. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Oh, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, just one quick question. Um, and, and just if we could maybe get an update. No, I should say it better. A reminder about the max issue, the max uh, index. Um, not only, not, and this is a countywide average. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that certain areas of the county tend towards higher and lower. Mm -hmm. I just would like to know how, how that looks, how that contours around the county so that maybe this is more normal for this part of the county, even though it's below the average. So just some, yeah. some understanding of that. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so the multimodal accessibility index or max index is something that went into the countywide rules last year. 
uh, as a result of our um, several series of revisions, um, some related to the target employment industrial land study and others not, um, to give us a better um, set of tools in the toolbox to address uh, transportation issues associated with redevelopment or land use changes. Previously, um, and I'm just doing a quick reminder here for everybody who wasn't on the board last year, previously we only looked at roadway level of service and we only really had an issue if a road was at level of service E or worse, which is E or F failing. And a lot of times there's not much you can do about that. Um, either the road is constrained and can't be widened or the amount of money you need to widen the road or fix an interche intersection or something like that is gonna be so prohibitive that it's years in, it, in the future. So the MAX index gives us uh, more flexibility and more options for addressing um, the evolving needs of Pinellas County in a redeveloping environment. Having said that, um, the methodology looks at a variety of factors that we score, such as proximity to bus service, avail a proximity to trails, uh, whether there is a sidewalk and separated path and some of the, the land use and site planning characteristics. Um, so it is a countywide average that we look at and we look at if you're below the countywide average, uh, we seek to have a pre-application meeting with the applicant so that we can have a conversation about what they can do at their site to mitigate that or address that. And it could be uh, site design considerations, it could be pavement markings, it could be you know some other low cost improvement on the site, but that's something we wanna work out with them. Um, in a few cases, we have not been able to have those pre-app meetings, and that's the reason for the continuance of the next item. So we wanna make sure we can work that out uh, early on before it goes to the local government uh, and gets a hearing there, and certainly before it comes to this board as a recommending item for the next one. The, I guess to answer your question more directly, where the max index is highest are gonna be in those activity centers and multimodal corridors because of the characteristics that are already there. So downtown St. Petersburg, downtown Clearwater, downtown Safety Harbor, Gulfport, Tarpon Springs, all those places are gonna pop. Um, you may remember that I showed you a map or we showed you a map of the Alt-19 corridor. That whole corridor is really high on the multimodal accessibility index. Um, so we take into consideration kind of what's in the surrounding area and what can be done. We're not gonna impose something unrealistic in an area where the, the max score is low, but it is a starting point for a conversation. Yeah, I just, again, I, I think of, you know, every, every area of the county is unique and some of the areas don't have bus service. Right. Uh, and in those same areas, there are some rural, believe it or not, in Pinellas County, there's some rural areas that really don't call for sidewalks and yet, we impose a penalty if they don't build sidewalks to nowhere. So I just wanna be careful as we move forward that we're, because these certain areas don't have the numbers because of the obvious restrictions that we don't end up imposing unfair things. Right. So that's all, I just wanted to- Yeah, the intent is to have it be a, um, a thoughtful negotiation yeah. with the local government and the applicant. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, it's been moved and seconded. We don't have a motion or a second yet, Madam Chair. I'll move approval. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please designate by saying aye. 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 All right, and then the next one is being continued to March, Rick? It is, uh, and um, as Tina indicated, we'll need a, a vote to continue that item until March. For the record, Madam Chair, the date certain is March 13th. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. You did fine. Um, Gina, do you want to give the PSTA activities report please i do thank you the psta board met on january 24th 2024 here's the highlight reel the board adopted a resolution authorizing the sale of the park street terminal property and the execution of documents necessary to transfer the property to the city this will allow psta to finalize the land swap process 
for the purposes of constructing the multimodal Clearwater Transit Center on the site at Court Street and Myrtle Avenue. The board approved um, a task work order with HNTB and their subconsultant Kimley Horn and Associates to conduct a transit concepts and alternatives, also known as TCAR, study of, alter of alternate 19 from downtown Clearwater to St. Petersburg. This study is the next step following Forward Pinellas' alternate 19 corridor plan, which is focused on redevelopment opportunities complemented by a conceptual premium transit plan. The TCAR study is a required step to obtain certain sources of state and federal funding. The next board meeting for PSTA will be held on February 28th at 9 a.m. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Quick, do you want to give the regional activities report? I will. Um, in your packet, there is a what I, what's been referred to as a technical org chart. I won't spend too much time on that, but I wanted to let you know that um, we have at the TMA leadership group requested $500,000 in startup funding to address the uh, management and legal framework for creating a regional metropolitan planning organization. The Florida Department of Transportation has identified um, a funding source uh, to provide those funds. What the org chart, uh, which uh, is in your packet, shows is that we are creating a, a structure for this to be an independent effort of the MPOs and that the department will uh, transfer the funding to one of the three MPOs who have an interlocal agreement with each other and that MPO will then uh, do a procurement to bring aboard a management consultant and legal advisor. Uh, we don't think any of us have uh, such a qualified consultant uh, an under contract today uh, with this kind of uh, national MPO formation experience. And that group will be then uh, managed by a project management team that will have a lead MPO um, project manager. I believe it's important to have one point of contact, two deputy project managers representing the other two MPOs. Uh, we don't yet know which MPO will lead this effort. We've had some initial discussions. And the work that they do will be um, uh, inter integrated with the TMA leadership group as the working committee. Uh, what the org chart also shows is that we envision uh, identifying some project advisors that will help guide this effort over the next couple of years, not just for the startup funding of $500,000, but potentially the second phase of funding, which would be to create the planning documents that are needed to certify an MPO to make it eligible to receive federal funds like we all are currently. Um, and just some ideas of who those advisors might be, the Tampa Bay Partnership representing the regional business community, uh, the MPO Advisory Council and may maybe an MPO staff director from around the state, potentially the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, the Department of Transportation, uh, Suncoast League of Cities, Suncoast Sierra Club, citizen appointees perhaps from the three counties and maybe the largest cities, and other stakeholders as deemed appropriate. And we haven't really talked about it, but the, those advisors might meet quarterly. We also recognize in the org chart that we will need to seek ultimately approval of a regional MPO structure from the boards of county commissioners and from the largest cities. And rather than just limiting it to the largest city in each county, I put in here that we would seek approval from cities over 50,000 population to be a little more inclusive. And then uh, ultimately this all has to go back to the governing boards. They have to approve it. And then it needs to go to the state and federal government for review and approval. Uh, ultimately, this comes down to the governor of each state, and in our case, Governor DeSantis approving the regional MPO merger if we all can come to an agreement. So this is really just a chart to kind of show that it's going to be an independent process led by the MPOs. It's not money coming from DOT that's being led by DOT, or we're not using DOT's consultant, just to clarify all that. And if you all have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Any questions, anyone? No? Okay, and Chelsea, do you wanna give the safety performance measures and targets?
So today we're gonna to talk about the performance measures and targets that are set for the federal, federal highway required uh, measures. Um, so at Ford Pinellas, we do a lot of tracking of data and reporting of performance metrics. Um, so this, what's in front of you today, is a little bit different because these are strictly some measures that are set by Federal Highway and uh, MPOs throughout the country are required to report on them on an annual basis, reevaluate the targets that we've been setting, and decide if we want to keep the targets that we set or if we want to change them and take a different approach. So the five targets that we're looking at are up on the screen. It's number and rate of fatal crashes. Uh, I'm sorry, not fatal crashes, fatalities, um, number and rate of serious injuries, and then also non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries combined. Now, we often get a lot of questions about that last one. Why are you combining that for uh, non-motorized um, users of the transportation system? Um, and that is because this is a requirement here from Federal Highway. However, we do report separately on those on an annual basis, so they're only being combined for the purpose of this exercise. So as an MPO, we have, a, we have options in how we set our targets. We are able to set any target that we'd like, or we can simply say that we support the targets set by the state, and then we track our progress towards meeting that target. In August of 2023, FDOT declared all of the targets for those measures are going to be set at zero for calendar year 2024. Um, as at Ford Pinellas, we've always decided to take a little bit of a different approach, understanding that the goal should always be zero fatalities and serious injuries on the transportation network. We have decided in the past to take a more realistic approach to setting targets, something that is achievable and that we can work towards. So up here on the screen, um, you can see the data for the current year, and I say current year with a caveat. So we don't usually look at one single year of data because in one year there may be an outlier. There may be a whole lot of one type of crashes and not a lot of a, another type. So we look at a five-year rolling average. And the data lags a little bit because of how long it takes for some of those crash reports to get into the system. So the most recent year of, or section, years of data that we're reporting on is 2018 to 2022. And then up there you'll see each of what those numbers were for each of the measures and then the target set uh, in 2023. And then the last column is how far away we are from meeting the target that we have set. You'll see for the first four, the annual fatality, fatalities and rates uh, and serious injuries and rate, we still have some progress to be, to be made. We're still you know, between 17 and 23% higher than the target that was set last year. However, you'll see a negative number in the bottom right corner. And that's for the average annual pedestrian and bike fatalities and serious injuries. So walking through each one of these, the red line is where our target is from the adopted target set last year. Average annual fatalities are unfortunately headed in the wrong direction. Those have kind of been increasing um, steadily. I will also point out that the last three years do include COVID years. And post-COVID and during COVID, we did see a spike in fatalities because traffic was down, people were driving more quickly on the roadways, and speed oftentimes results in fatalities when it comes to crashes. So we did see a 1.4% increase in the five-year annual average. In number of serious injuries, we have seen a steady decline. A question we always get on this is why are we seeing this? Um, there are a myriad of reasons. Um, one may be that cars are getting uh, safer. So in lower speed crashes where someone may be injured uh, with a safer vehicle, that crash may be less severe of an injury. Um, but we're also looking at some other, some other options um, for, to support that. So we've seen a 7.1% decrease in the serious injury crashes, but still a little bit above that target. Our average annual fatality rates have also increased, going along with the fatalities themselves. And our serious injury rates um, continued their downward uh, push with a nearly 6% decrease. And then this is where we have met our target. This is the bike ped serious injuries and fatalities. The target was set, it says a 2023 target, but I will know that that target has stood since 2019. When it comes to the serious injury rates and totals, those two targets we did readjust last year because we met the target that was set. So this one has not been touched since about 2019. We did see a 5.5% decrease and we are now officially below the target that was set last year and we um, have a recommendation for setting a new target. 
We do like to take a minute to compare the crash um, fatality rates of Pinellas County with some other counties across the state. And as you'll see up here in the chart, we are a little bit below the fatality rate, the, uh, below the statewide average. And when you compare us to some of the other more urban counties like Hillsborough and Miami-Dade, we're kind of right in line. Our numbers are fairly similar. But when you compare us with more rural counties, you see that our fatality rate is quite a bit lower. And this is typically because, as I had said earlier, higher speeds do result often in more severe and fatal crashes. And some of our more rural areas tend to have wider open roads, very few stoplights in between, lots of opportunities to get some speed, and that can unfortunately result in a fatality. Serious injury rates were a little bit higher than the statewide average on this one, but kind of in line with our urban partners, and you'll also see we're quite a bit lower than Sarasota uh, County and Pasco County to the north. So this is the staff recommendation. As I noted, the serious injuries and serious injury rate, those uh, targets were lowered last year since we had met that target. Um, but this year, we are proposing that we retain the targets set in 2023 for those first four, since we still have not yet met them and we still have some progress to be made. But on that last, uh, the, uh, the last measure there, the average annual pedestrian bike fatality and city nearest injuries, we are recommending to set a target of 187.2, which uh, we would be about just under 7% above um, at this time. That measure was set using the same methodology that we've used in years past to set a methodology. We looked at the highest number in the last five years and the lowest number in the last five years. We calculated the percent difference, and then we applied that to the most recent year of data, and that's how we came to our target. So that number comes from there. I will say that we'd also like to restate the goal that we should have zero fatal and serious injury crashes on our transportation network. And we're gonna, we're gonna continue to monitor this going forward. And this is important when we bring to you the transportation improvement program, both the fall and then again in the spring, and our priority lists, the projects that we put forward are what's gonna help us make a difference towards reaching the targets that we set and get us closer to zero. When we adopt the transportation improvement program, there is a large section on performance reporting, and we need to document to the state and the feds what we're doing as an agency to help us meet the targets that we set. So it's important that we put forward projects that help us get there, and then we report that on an annual basis. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Commissioner Eggers? Yeah, um, so you say you, you go through a lot of crash reports. Mm -hmm. On the fatality piece, do you see a pretty consistent messaging about speeds, higher speeds with the, with the fatalities? Yes. Um, when it's vehicle on vehicle or just a single vehicle, speed is all, almost always a factor. Um, and also, if it's a vehicle versus pedestrian, again, it's, it comes down to if a pedestrian gets hit with a car that's driving 15 miles an hour, probably going to be okay. If that car's going any faster, it could very quickly turn into a fatality. Also, a lot of our pedestrian and bicycle crashes are at night, and some of that has to do with response time, because if the car can't see the pedestrian in time, they don't have time to react, and those crashes can often turn into fatalities and serious injuries. So speed is a very common factor. Well, the, the messaging from this is there are things that we can do. Correct. Yeah. I, I just I think um, you may have made a comment about US-19. Um, it really has been a wonderful addition to move traffic, but I, I get real stubborn sometimes because I guess I'm getting older as well, but just if I'm going 60 in that 55 or 62, just not moving over, but people go, they'll, they'll take over two lanes to get around three cars to get back in front of you so they can get up to 75 and 80. I don't know that I've ever seen any enforcement on that on that road. I'm sure there has been, I just haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I just think that's that's a, big issue in mm -hmm. our county now that we've provided this wonderful road to move traffic it is, yeah. it is scary. Well, I will say City of Largo is very good about sitting out there near East Bay and pulling a lot of people over. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> Yep. Largo's doing their piece. Largo's doing their piece. <laughs> Highway Patrol is out there sometimes, and Pinellas Park sometimes gets people as they're coming off of the 49th Street overpass headed southbound, and they'll just sit there and pull. They're the never there when those folks are flying by me at 80 miles an hour. So anyway, thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Gerard. Uh, 
In the pedestrian fatalities, uh, is there any metric measuring uh, whether the pedestrian was crossing the road mid-block or not in a, not in a crosswalk? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, and we, we do track all of that separately. If there's a specific metric that you need, I'm, I probably don't have it today, but if you can send me an email, we have a very comprehensive crash database, and that is one of the metrics that we could pull for you. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Move approval. It's been moved and seconded. On I didn't catch you made the motion, I'm sorry. Thank you. What'd she say? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, thank you, Chelsea. And now for the multimodal impact fee ordinance update, Jared. All right, good afternoon, board members. Jared Austin with Ford Pinellas. Um, today I'm gonna to be walking you through a fairly brief update um, of our ongoing multimodal impact fee ordinance update. So just a little bit of a background in terms of what even is the countywide multimodal impact fee ordinance. Um, this came about as a means, um, or was designed rather to ensure that new development that comes online throughout our county um, pays its fair share. What I mean by that is we all know as new development comes online, it puts various strains on our transportation networks um, throughout the county. And so there are fees that are collected from that development that are meant to help offset um, some of those, those uh, new developments. And uh, the, the impact fee it specifically is um, calculated based on land use type, cost of new lane mile of roadway, various trip generation factors that all sort of uh, calculate into what it is specifically um, that that fee is paid by the developer to help offset those costs. Um, now those fees that are collected can only be spent within a defined area, and I'll um, highlight some of that in a later slide. Um, but the funds are typically used for improvements that are identified as priorities um, by the local jurisdiction, um, but there are some challenges with that as well. Um, so just some historic policy context. Um, the impact fee ordinance itself is supposed to be updated on a two-year uh, timeline. Uh, we did kind of uh, fall out of uh, that cycle with our last update that happened back in 2019. As you all likely remember, a lot happened shortly after um, 2019. Um, and so we kind of fell out of that, but we are hoping to get back on that, that two-year cycle after this update. Um, currently, the ordinance uh, encompasses all jurisdictions within Pinellas County. This is fairly unique. Um, if you look towards Hillsborough County as an example, um, you know, Hillsborough County, unincorporated county may have its own ordinance. City of Tampa will have its own. Um, and we see that that's a common trend. So ours is different in that it encompasses all 25 local governments. And whatever fee is collected within that jurisdiction, a portion of that does go back to uh, the county as well. And really the logic there is just that development that comes online and say city of Dunedin or Largo or St. Pete, um, it's not just impacting that jurisdiction, it's also impacting a broader county-wide network. Um, and on that same note, uh, there was a uh, mysterious clause written into that uh, back in the, the 80s um, that if 10% of the total countywide population chooses to opt out of the ordinance, it is voided. So something to be uh, mindful of as we go through this, this update. So this is just a high-level overview of a consolidated fee comparison by jurisdiction um, of where kind of Pinellas County sits and some neighboring county or some neighboring jurisdictions as well as some other jurisdictions throughout the state based on some kind of typical land use typologies we would see. Um, as you can tell by Pinellas County, the numbers up there in the bold, um, we are substantially lower than many of these other jurisdictions. Um, the one that we kind of come the closest to is City of Tampa. However, when we met with City of Tampa staff, um, we were informed that their numbers have actually not been updated since 1989. And that was largely due even at the, uh, at the time, they were trying to encourage um, more development within the city. And so those numbers were kept uh, fairly low. Um, so this is kind of what I talked about a little bit earlier with the impact fee districts. That's what's uh, visualized on the right in that map. Um, overwhelmingly, we met with um, public works, housing, community development, economic development, uh, building and development review services in terms of external partners. We met with transportation and land use planning staff with City of St. Pete, City of Clearwater, and City of Largo, and overwhelmingly heard that the existing ordinance is not keeping up 
with a lot of the um, transportation demand impacts being put on their networks by new development. Uh, furthermore, many felt that the existing ordinance lacks a lot of flexibility in terms of what dollars um, can go to what projects. And just to kind of highlight uh, some of the complexities you run into when you have an ordinance that encompasses 25 local governments, you know, City of Largo, for instance, kind of wanted to take more of a City of Sarasota approach where the entire city could be an impact fee district compared to City of St. Petersburg actually wanted to get more specialized within their downtown impact fee district. And so these are challenges we'll have to navigate throughout some of this process. One thing though, overwhelmingly, we also heard is that whatever fee calculation we come up with as part of this effort, whether it's continuing with what we have currently or moving to something more comprehensive like a mobility fee, the simplicity of the fee calculation is a must. This is not something that can just be understood by the project management team, it needs to be understood by the people at the zoning counter all the way out to the developers who would be ultimately impacted by this. And one of the things that um, some Insight Economic Development provided to us is that in terms of what they're hearing from a lot of enterprise that's relocating here or some of the developers they speak with, it's not so much that they have an issue with the fee itself, it's the simplicity of the process or lack thereof that really is kind of the most time consuming and frustrating effort for them. So that's something we're definitely gonna be keeping in mind as we go throughout this update. Uh, and then finally, something that folks wanted us to keep in mind is that if in the event that the impact fees do go up um, for a number of the land use typologies that we have within this ordinance, um, we wanted, uh, they, many folks stressed that, that we wanted to consider uh, impact fee reductions for affordable housing because as housing is a, a, a very important um, factor in what we're dealing with in a lot of the county um, right now, we don't want those costs to impact our ability to meet that affordable housing demand. So this is just a very rough high level timeline. One thing I will stress, we are very much in the early phases of this effort. We have not even selected a consultant um, to be on, to come on board with us yet and, and help us with that effort. We are currently um, kind of going through some of the proposals that we've received currently and will hopefully have made a decision in the uh, March timeframe and then can hopefully get started um, uh, officially in more probably the April timeframe. Um, as you can probably tell by what I've outlined already, um, this is going to be a very comprehensive and involved process um, and will likely take probably an 18 to 24 month time frame uh, in order to complete just because we have a number of stakeholders that are involved in this and the existing ordinance kind of touches a little bit of everyone from throughout the county. So um, again, that was a very high level overview. I know we covered a lot there pretty briefly, but I'm happy to take any questions you might have on the existing ordinance. Questions, Commissioner uh, Mayor Boljowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, unless we're going to do something different, and you kind of alluded that we might, generally an impact fee, you can only use the money for um, the impact of new residents to your community. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be the case with this? Or the fees that are collected can only go um, to basically uh, development that is, a, or challenges that are a result of the uh, development, they can't go towards an existing deficiency, if that's what you mean. You said they can't or they, can? They cannot. Yeah, so I'm asking as you go through this, it's just some feedback. Sure. Given that we're very built out, I mean, in the 70s and 80s is kind of when the whole impact fee thing came on board. <laughs> And it was perfect for what it was at the time. But we're not in that time anymore. We are built out. And so um, I can only speak for my community, but I'm sure everybody else is going through this. Um, we are getting replacement <coughs> residents now to turn over. Um, yes, in the last, in, in my city, it, I think we increased our residents by about 1,200 people in the last 10 years from the census right. records. Um, because we just don't have, yes, there's been new apartment complexes and stuff, but there's just not that much land. And, I, and I'm sure a number, any number of the cities here are experiencing the same thing. So when we get fees, whether they're structured as an you know, impact fee or not, I, I'm pointing this out because you're not, it's not the same thing and we don't have the same needs. Right. And so, just like the fire impact fee they pay. 
Same thing. We can only use it for increased number of apparatuses or air breathing machines or radios because of increased population. So I don't know if there's anything you can do about that, if it's restructuring how it's looked at or yeah. whatever. I think we need to address it. Sure. Thank you. I'll just add that the two options that we're looking at, the transportation impact fee update or the mobility fee, have some different mechanisms. And for a mobility fee, for instance, you could say that these are the needs in this area for transportation. And then as development comes in and uh, puts additional impact on that, you're actually working toward fixing those specific needs. Whereas with a traditional impact fee, uh, it's, a, it's a standards driven approach, not an improvements driven approach. So you're saying you generate this much additional new trips, we need to find a project to mitigate uh, in this area that's reasonably related to your development. So there's two different approaches to that. The former could actually cover operating expenses um, and things like that. The latter is limited to capital. Um, but we're gonna go down this path and look at the pros and cons of both. And it's, um, it's also, for everybody's perspective, nobody solved a transportation problem with an impact fee. It's part of the solution, and it can provide a local match to meet um, the requirements of state and federal funds, too. So sometimes it's, you gotta give a little to get a little. Commissioner Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and you may have, may have said this, or maybe I missed it. When did we last review that for penalty? Uh, the last uh, kind of general review of the ordinance was back in 2019. 19. That was the last update, yeah. On this chart here, um, comparing them, it's got 2016 by Pinellas and 2021 by Orange. And so are these just the, what does that mean? What do those dates mean? The 2016, I'm not sure. I think it might have been the last major overhaul of the ordinance. That's where um, I think we revisited some of the cost assumptions and more of a complete okay. update as opposed to a few tweaks here. Right. Thanks. And, and most of the foundational data uh, for this is from 1989 that I collected as a consultant. Um, trip generation rates and trip lengths and trip diversion and all those kinds of things. And the, the, the impact fee is based on the cost to widen a lane mile of roadway. In 1989? Well, we've, <laughs> we've, we've elevated those dollars. Um, but, you know, we're not building too many more lane miles of road. Yeah, not here in Pinellas, yeah. right. Any other questions? Yeah, this is just an update today. Uh, this is a, a very complex undertaking, so we wanted to give you a preview before we actually got underway with a consultant. All right, and I have the next item as well. This worked seamlessly earlier, we'll see. Awesome. Okay, well this is something that was touched on briefly um, by my colleague Linda Fisher at our uh, last board meeting related to our housing action plan. And it's something um, that actually myself and my colleague Emma have been working on with a number of local governments um, throughout the county, um, basically to track projects that we have come online uh, through the Live Local Act, um, as well as some of the predecessor legislation. So I should just caveat that even though this is called the Live Local Act Affordable Housing Dashboard, um, any projects that came online via House Bill 1339 or Senate Bill 962 prior are also reflected in this dashboard. Um, and really what the intent was is as we were going around and, and meeting with folks related to a lot of the target employment industrial land study work um, that was mentioned earlier, a lot of the questions we got from locals was, well, who's tracking a lot of these preemptive um, uh, 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 projects that come online as, as a result of some of this preemptive legislation? And so that's something that we felt we could, we could do in-house, and that's kind of what we're looking at here. So I'll just kind of give you a general lay of the land, and then I'll show you uh, exactly how some of the functionality works. Um, so some of the key metrics that we're looking at here in the dashboard is the actual total acreage impacted uh, countywide by projects that have come through 
um, some of this preemptive legislation, as well as the actual total units proposed, and of those, how many specifically fall within the affordable criteria outlined by the legislation, so zero to 120% AMI. Um, we have another indicator down here that is actually specifically looking at how many units are coming online within each uh, AMI or area median income bracket. So that will uh, split it up between zero to 30% AMI, 30 to 50, and so on. Um, and then uh, finally up here, we have the percent of land use impacted. So what that's essentially showing is that of all the developments that we've had come online through this legislation, 86% of the land impacted has been under employment land, which is um, uh, one of our countywide plan map categories. Um, so just kind of now moving to showcase exactly what this dashboard does. Uh, I'm gonna start by using the city of St. Pete as an example, and we have three different projects. Oh, one moment, oh no. Oh, one moment. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right, let's reload this. Apologies about that. All right, we're back online. Um, so again, just using City of St. Petersburg as an example, I'll select each of the projects that we have here and it will zoom to all of the projects that are currently uh, have come through uh, the city of St. Petersburg via um, some of these preemptive bills. You'll notice that each of the metrics will change accordingly based on the project that you select or the jurisdiction that you go towards. Um, we do have some other functionality in here, such as it does allow the user to search by parcel ID. Most folks are probably not gonna use that, but we do include it um, for some of our planners who may be accessing this tool. Right now, um, all the projects that we have in here are in the application submitted phase, which is why that's the only project status listed. As we get updates from our local partners, um, this is able to update in real time. So when projects move from application to submitted towards something like under construction or constructed, that will be reflected in here as well. Um, we also have the project completion date. Um, we only have a few that actually have a set deadline, but if I was to click one, for instance, um, you'll see the projects uh, sort of disappear and the metrics change accordingly. Um, say I just wanted to look uh, of these St. Pete projects um, at the ones that were uh, specifically impacting employment lands. Um, I can just click over here and it will isolate just the ones that are impacting uh, employment. And again, all of these metrics are gonna change accordingly. Now if I zoom back out and go to the city of Largo and they only have one project, which is why it zooms in so close to, to it. Um, this actually, this tool allows some additional functionality as well. So all of these projects are totally interactive. So if you click any of them, it will pull up more information about each. Specifically, this is the information that we're actually being fed by the local governments um, that we're uh, updating into this tool. And you can get more detailed information with each, such as whether or not it's in a coastal high hazard area, uh, how many stories it is, and then right here, um, it'll actually tell you, um, in this case, it was a result of the Live Local Act. Um, some of the other projects, um, it will say uh, House Bill 1339 or Senate Bill 962, um, depending on uh, what legislation it was taking advantage of. So that's just kind of a high level overview of this tool. Um, I will also say it's fully interactive. So if for instance, you pulled it up and you know immediately you just wanna to go to the city of St. Pete, you can just scroll in here as well and it will adjust all the metrics uh, uh, accordingly. Uh, and so that's just kind of an overview of the tool. I will say it is public, so we will send out the link uh, and you can share it with your constituents, with your uh, planning staff. Um, and again, this information that we get is only as good as what's fed to us by the local government. So we encourage you to, to put it on their radar. Yes. So this is land use, employment, uh, is it that's, does that include industrial? Yes, yeah, so the so industrial land, uh, a lot of times on our, because we're using countywide plan map categories, um, falls under the employment category more broadly. Um, so at a local level, typically those are gonna be our industrial lands. So um, how much on the, on the select all, how much of that is industrial? How much of the 60 acres? Yeah, so about 51.6 um, acres. Uh, so just using the tool, if I click here on just the employment lands, about 51.6 uh, acres have been impacted um, by the 
the preemptive legislation. We have, we have a total industrial land acreage, right? Uh, from around the county? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure offhand. I know the ones that fall in our target employment center, <clears throat> excuse me, specifically, it's around 13,000 acres um, total, um, but there's more outside of that as well. And in fact, the Largo case, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the Largo um, Live Local project um, here, uh, that is uh, industrial land that's actually outside of our target employment centers. I think that's going to be something important to track, the target industrial, TEC, target employment, industrial, whatever, centers, I think are important. And um, it's it, to see each of the effects of the, and this is the state, the new state statutes that are allowing yes. this. And I think this is a good educational tool to pass along to our legislative delegation to show them what's happening and where it's coming from and how it to translate an example of what could have gone on that property. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it might have been job in, uh, better jobs created and why those lands are so important to us and what that legislation is doing. I mean, this is kind of real life right. um, scenario. I think it's important that they get that. They, I don't know that they un always understand the unintended consequences. So, so I think that's another piece that we can do. We should do the dashboard for Pasco County and really hit that <laughs> home. They've been complaining bitterly yeah, about yeah. this. Yes. Commissioner Gerard. Uh, on the, uh, the affordable units uh, by AMI category, uh, because it's broken down by ranges. Yes. Um, so we go 80 to 120% of AMI, which generally you might start saying is getting into uh, you know, workforce-style housing. Mm -hmm. uh, would that include, even though it seems to be broken out by range, would that also include, uh, you know, the lower a AMI categories too, like 50 to 80 percent? Yeah, so if you, um, actually using this as an example, and I'll, I'll kind of show off some of the features, um, if you actually, you can zoom in um, to those lower brackets. So if you were just maybe wanting to look at, you know, how many countywide, um, of the, of the countywide projects we're seeing come online, how many are actually, how many units are actually being built in that zero to 30 and 30 to 50? Um, that's what you'll be able to do. So here we have 13 units coming online in the zero to 30 category, and then we have about 67 in the 30 to 50 range. Right, so, um, so we'll take the 30 to 50%. That's 30 to 50% of AMI and if you were to go to the category of 80 to 120 percent, that means that 30 to 50 percent is precluded. So if a, if a uh, project was to go in promising 30 to 40 percent of afford affordable, quote, afford but they designate 80 to 120 percent, anybody who comes in at 30 to 50 percent who wants to live there cannot live there. Right. So uh, kind of. Uh, case uh, example, I think, of what, assuming I understand what you're saying, is if I actually go to the Can Largo... you go somewhere besides Largo? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I can, actually. Uh, let's see. One of the uh, St. Pete projects, I think this one. Much better. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, so this particular property, uh, I believe, is the Raytheon property. Um, this one is, uh, it doesn't fall under the Live Local Act um, per se, but you can see that the units that are being built um, here are gonna fall within that 80 to 120% range. The reason I just wanted to highlight the, the City of Largo case is because that's our first actual Live Local project. Yeah. Um, and that one, all of the units are being built within 80 to 120% AMI, but the legislation is geared so that when they say 40% affordable, 120% AMI falls within what they deem affordable. So they, they can do all 120 and, and still qualify. And I think that's why this dashboard is helpful is because we can actually see of the projects taking advantage of these preemptions, what specific units are getting built and in what uh, income bracket. Yeah, so we can see that the, that the uh, population that's in more desperate straits for affordable style housing are actually not being addressed. Sure. All right, thank you. Any further questions on this issue? 
You just want Commissioner Egger? I, I'm, I just want to go back to the question that I'd asked before. So from us, for, from us being able to track it and understand it um, dashboard-wise or education-wise, we have so many acres in this county um, that, it, that is industrial, that is employment, I, I guess industrial is, is it within the employment category. Um, and I just think it's going to be important to start tracking that so that it is, a, it is a number that we see and we see how it's being affected for the good or for the bad. And, and I think we also need to define, again, for our legislators, what target employment areas are versus industrial land. So, right. so the, the, the target employment areas are the ones we really want to be careful of, right. more so. The others, we're providing a lot more flexibility and latitude to address some of the things that they're hoping that we would address so that we can maybe do both. We can do some of those industrial land um, things that don't affect what our target employment right. phase is. So I think understanding that difference to be able to, again, educate so that maybe tweaks to their live local thing can be addressed. Certainly. If we continue to look at that and continue to tweak it, we might want to continue to educate. Definitely. And um, we do try and include more information in each of these projects that are in here. Um, so we do try and track, for instance, if they're in a target employment center, we do make note of that. Um, but one thing that might be helpful is to actually overlay that on here so it's a little bit more clear. And we'll probably talk a little bit more internally. Um, but um, at least for the purposes of now, this is public and free to share. So definitely do a take advantage of it where you can. Yeah, I think what, whatever we have, yeah. we should put together and be very descriptive for our legislators. Just definitely. when they come back to town, they're getting this report on a quarterly basis or whatever in this county. Here's what's going on. Some of it's been good, but some of it's not been good. And we just need to make sure that they have a clear understanding. Definitely. All righty. Well, thank you all very much. Spotlight update. Yes, I have a couple of items that I'm going to spend a little time on. Uh, the first in your uh, agenda item is uh, one of our uh, cornerstones is the vision for the US 19 corridor. And we've been working with the Florida Department of Transportation for some time on this. And I'm pleased to say we uh, have made some good progress lately. And we are going to be bringing uh, this uh, item to you in, in the coming months. The, um, this concerns the stretch of US 19 north from just north of Curley Road, north of Nebraska Avenue, all the way up to the county line. And uh, we've had a project development environmental study that's been approved for quite some time. I think it dates back to the 1990s or so that identified um, the single point interchanges being built uh, along US 19 at major intersections, Klosterman, Alderman, Tarpon Avenue, and so on. Um, we've been uh, in a discussion with DOT to see if there was some way that we could look at um, a less expensive uh, kind of improvement since you have Lake Tarpon on one side and not a lot of through traffic on most of those locations. When you get to Tarpon Avenue, you do, but at Alderman, Klosterman, uh, and another one there, they're, they're kind of dead end at the lake. Uh, the department came back after some evaluation and said they couldn't really manage these um, at grade um, with innovative intersection approaches given the amount of growth that's happening uh, in the corridor and in the region. Uh, but they were willing to look at another concept. And the concept that they've identified that could work is a, a viaduct concept or essentially what you see on the Selman Expressway in Tampa over Gandy Boulevard where it's elevated and you still have the permeability underneath um, allowing access to businesses, crossing underneath, and you don't have the big walls that you see through most of Clearwater and Pinellas Park and, and Largo. Not so much Pinellas Park, but Largo. Um, the department um, has put together a concept. They've given us some trade-offs and considerations for that viaduct, and there's some really meaty things for us to dig into that I think the public and the business community are going to be very interested in. For instance, um, the number of through lanes on the main line and the number of through lanes on the frontage roads um, are, are variables that we need to think about that um, are based kind of on the constructability of it and then how much space you have underneath and do you want to make use of that space 
Um, you know, it's been suggested we could put pickleball courts in there or parks or other things. I don't know if there's a desire to do that, but it's a question. Um, but more importantly, we've heard from the business community in Palm Harbor that they feel that they will uh, lose, um, they will have economic impacts that are negative uh, to all those mom and pop businesses along there if people can't access the businesses or can't see them um, if they're elevated. And they point to the land use changes that have happened through Clearwater and to the south in Largo, where we did see a lot of conversion of commercial and retail uses to apartments and multifamily. Uh, and some are still kind of underutilized and vacant. Without getting into all the details of those trade-offs, um, the, the concept seems to be pretty workable, uh, but there are some cost differences. And what we're proposing to do is bring this to the advisory committees in March uh, and to go out to the public um, to meet with the Tarpon Springs Board of Commissioners with this information, to have a community meeting uh, in that area, say at St. Pete College, uh, in Palm Harbor, perhaps uh, in, in uh, the White Chapel area where we've had a previous meeting, uh, and then through our advisory committees and bring it back to this board in, in May uh, is the target where um, you could then weigh in and we could determine what we should include in the long range transportation plan. Um, the the trade-offs, as I mentioned, are um, how many ramps that are built into it um, to allow access and the number of ramps that you limit it. In other words, if you're building a bridge, a viaduct, you're not gonna have the same on and off ramps if you build discrete interchanges. Uh, and the more or the fewer ramps you have, the more volume you need to accommodate at the ramps you do have, which puts pressure to widen out the frontage roads to three lanes. We're very concerned with three lane frontage roads because it kind of defeats the purpose and you end up with high speed frontage roads when they should be 30 to 35 mile an hour frontage roads. So that's one of the trade offs that we're working in. So we might come back with a modified viaduct that kind of balances those two issues that allows more access ramps and maybe a shorter bridge. It would also lower the cost potentially. So a lot of interesting trade offs. All of these come with better walking and bicycling accommodations, but I still question how good that's gonna be if the speed on these big wide frontage roads is north of 40 or 50 miles an hour. Um, so I really commend the department for, for looking at this and coming up with some creative solutions. We've still got a little bit of work to do, but I just wanted to give you an update that March through May, we're gonna be doing a lot of outreach. We're gonna be engaging with the business community, with the elected officials, with the public, and you'll probably be hearing from some folks. So uh, we will share that with you. We'll, we'll probably put a page on our website dedicated to this uh, and, and have a lot of robust in, input. Let's see if y'all have any questions about that. Yeah, so what, what are you, when you say in the next two months you're gonna go out and talk to these groups, what are you gonna show them? Hopefully it's not just what you just said because I'm not having a clear vision of what you're talking We're gonna about. have some um, illustrated concepts from the department that, that show what they're gonna be like. You remember when we had the pedestrian underpass discussion about a year or two ago? Yeah. They came up with those visuals that showed what it looked like and whether you were driving on the main line or whether you were on the frontage road, you could visualize it. I don't have those today, so I can't show you that right now. But that's what we're gonna, um, have ready and show to the public. And if I can have that ready in advance um, to show you all before we go out to the public, I'll do that. That's the, that's the goal. But you, you said you're gonna be back here in two months to tell well, us what the Well, I think we're gonna ask you in May, um, most likely in May, to weigh in on the concepts formally as a board, but we'll try to give you a preview before that. I don't wanna just hit you over the head with this one time. Well, I'd kinda like to see it before we send it out. Okay. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I just, I feel, I'm feeling a you little. Great description yeah. <laughs> I didn't quite capture it for you. <laughs> yeah. I was trying. I was all of a sudden starting to see David Ballard Geddes Jr.'s uh, <laughs> Disney thing going down 19, uh, kind of, sort of. So anyway, if, yeah. uh, I'd love to see it before you go. But anyway. Well, um, we can work with you on that timeline. Maybe what we can do is when we're ready to go out to the public, we can, if that's in March, let's say late March, um, then we can uh, give you a preview at the March board meeting okay. and see if it's okay. But we're gonna have to identify some dates and we're gonna have to have things scheduled, but we'll give you a chance to look at it first. 
I'm afraid if we wait and, and wait until you're like super comfortable with it, we're gonna miss the window of getting it adopted into the long range plan. And that's kind of what we're timing it for. I don't wanna rush. I don't wanna rush anything. We can always amend the long range plan <laughs> if we need to. I know, like we can. You don't wanna rush on something on US 19 that's been going on for 30 years? I'm cheesing, it's a joke. <laughs> Well, Just a joke. I, I raised this issue with the department in 2016. And here we are in 2024, we're finally getting to a point where we're coming together around a concept that, that is an alternative to what's in the adopted pd &E. It was like with Chelsea having, you know, no more fatalities than 187.2. I'm like, I didn't know there was 0.2 of a human being. <laughs> but I thought it was too soon for me to make a joke. So I do want to point out though, that what the mayor said over here, while she said it in jest, couldn't be further from the truth. Because the one word that I wrote down on my paper when, I don't know, somebody was up there talking, that we never talk about here is having a sense of urgency about the things that we do. Because we act and we talk like we've got another 25 or 30 years to work on this stuff. When actuality, in actuality, we're 50 years behind already. Yep. So, I mean, at what point do we put the pedal to the metal and just say, come on, enough is enough. We got to get stuff done. Well, I, I, I agree with you. I'm just saying. Oh, my we, God. That we've Stop had... the music <laughs> right <laughs> now. That wasn't, that wasn't being taped, was it, uh, <laughs> that I agreed with her? Um, no, but we've been waiting for five or six years to get this yeah. concept, and now we're talking about rushing to get this thing out in two months. I'm just saying, I, you know, I just want to make sure I know what the heck we're even peddling. Yeah. Um, well, the, we, we've, we've asked the department and their consultant to work on this, bring something back to us. They didn't think they could do it much before March. So we're waiting on that, their timeline. As soon as they're ready, we'll, sh we'll share it. And I'll just give you an example, and I'm not trying to dig up other things, but we've talked a lot, and I know we're going to talk about it again here today, Drew Street, mm -hmm. uh, the, the pros, cons, all the different. It, and compared to the discussions that we had on 34th Street South, it's like this versus this. I mean, in my recollection, we talk, we've talked a lot about one and not the other. I want to make sure we talk a lot about what it is we're proposing before we, like, go asking people there, oh, we love it, we love it, and then it came back, comes back here and we're saying, well, we don't like it, so mm -hmm. yeah. then what? So, and I have one yeah. more thing to say about what you just said. You could fill this room with notebooks like this of studies that have been done by consultants in the last 50 years on this issue that we're talking about here today. I mean, that is just nuts. So if you want to look up about where the problems are, how about we look at some of the consultants who take forever to get any damn thing done? Okay, I'm done. Did you want to have something, Eric? Yes. So with, when you talk about the, the viaduct concept and you mentioned the, the uh, Leroy Selman Expressway, that's if you're taking the Gandhi Bridge uh, east toward Tampa and then you come to the mainland and you can either go to the right and stay on Gandhi Boulevard or take the viaduct over. Right. Yeah. So that's a one-lane viaduct. Mm -hmm. uh, and then all the, the uh, at-grade lanes for Gandhi stay there. But if you had a two-lane viaduct, then that would actually take away a lane of Gandhi? No. Um, well, the only thing that's similar is that it's an elevated roadway over an existing roadway. Yeah. So, um, and they raised it higher to increase the visibility of the businesses. So instead of 16 feet high, they put it 30 feet high on the, on the Crosstown extension. Yeah, I don't know how many folks here have taken that, that viaduct, but boy, it's a blessing if you're trying, yeah. if you, if you're trying to get to a, a lightning game. It's another way of, of handling the traffic in the US 19 corridor than how we've handled it to the south, right. where the interchanges um, have, have helped move traffic faster, but they've also kind of blocked off the visual of what's down below. Yeah. 
Um, and, and we've also seen crashes shift from the main line to the frontage roads at the junctions where the speeds are pretty high in those merge areas. You've got people coming off US 19, not doing 55, and they're merging onto a road where it's 35 to 40. And nobody's going 35 to 40 on the frontage roads. So that's one of the things we'd like to figure out better going forward. We also have a frontage road retrofit study that's still waiting to get polished uh, and bring that back to you at some point in the future. But that's for the existing sections, and we'll take that when, we're, when, it, when it's ready. We're not quite there yet. But I, I, hear your, I hear your concerns and your points, and we'll make sure that yeah, we build in a review here before we go out to the public. Vice Mayor Knapp. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just, just another point of or question is, you know, we've got all this talk now about merging into a regional MPO at the same time, and yet this project is, well, right now, tentatively, we're going to terminate at the county line. So are there con some contingencies already in there for thinking bigger? Um, because I would imagine the folks in, you know, Holiday might have something to say about this project. Absolutely. And we've had those conversations with Pasco County. They've taken a policy approach very different from Pinellas where they have chosen to not build the interchanges on US-19. They were going down that path too, and they completely changed course about 10 years ago, and they adopted a plan that was very, very different. So they are looking to um, redevelop around US-19 in a, in a very different way. But that's a conversation we can continue to have with them. We are looking to build in a regional transit project into this, and if it's incorporated into the scope and the design, that could be a cheaper, more efficient way to, to get that in, and that would provide that connection as well. Um, but we'll continue to ask PASCO if they have any desire to look at something different in that quarter. Yeah, we have that okay, PASCO east-west county, it, it, you know, and then you got Pinellas, a north-south north south county, so it kind of runs into that whole conversation about, yeah. um, you know, What's their priority? Their yep. priority is east-west for them. I mean, not that they don't care about north-south. And then the other thing, and, I, and I'm glad um, Commissioner Eisner is here, is that um, in 2017, I think, the Tarpon Springs Board of Commissioners asked us to take the interchange at Tarpon Avenue out of the long-range plan completely, so we did that. So that's no longer in our plan. But now that we're adopting this plan, you know, we'd like to get their direction and their guidance um, before we adopt the plan. Is, is that an interchange? Is that a viaduct? You know, those are the things that we'll want to hear from your perspective. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, if you're ready, I'll move on. Please do. Okay, the next item uh, is, is a little tricky and I'll try to get through it a little easier than I did the last one. Um, in, under enhancing beach community access, we had a discussion uh, with the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Board um, about uh, some signs that Pinellas County has put up on the Dunedin Causeway. There were um, some concerns, and, and there's a long history to this, but I'll back up. A couple of years ago, there was a very serious injury on the Bel Air, on the Bel Air Causeway Bridge, different bridge, Bel Air Causeway, where a bicyclist collided with a pedestrian and the uh, person walking incurred like $50,000 of medical bills because of the serious injury. Um, and the, the roadways are a little bit different. The sidewalk is actually wider on the Bel Air Causeway. But as a result of that crash and at the request of the citizen and um, uh, some of our board members, Pinellas County installed signs saying, dismount your bike if you're, if you're riding on the sidewalk over the Bel Air Causeway. Now, uh, of the Bel Air Causeway. I'm talking about Bel Air. Oh, this I'm is sorry. the genesis of all this. Oh. Um, the difference is that the Bel Air Causeway has a, um, it's not protected, but it's a buffered bike lane that's very wide, so it's a little com more comfortable to ride your bike over that bridge. Now, the Dunedin Causeway has a similar situation. Until the, the new bridge comes, we have a serious pinch point at the, at the long bridge where it's effectively three or four feet wide at those pinch points. And bicyclists and pedestrians are all often in conflict. The county has received numerous complaints. Um, there is, um, um, they may be multiple complaints from one person, but they've received complaints that uh, bicyclists and pedestrians are in conflict there. 
So the county, being consistent, put the similar signs up on the Dunedin Causeway to dismount and ride with traffic if you're on a bike, if you're going to ride. The difference is the Dunedin Causeway, if you've ever tried to ride a bike over there, I have, uh, there is no shoulder. Traffic goes far faster than 35 miles an hour. There is no bike lane. It's scary. Um, so uh, there has been a request uh, from a member of our BPAC, and the BPAC uh, unanimously voted to support this, that um, we bring it to the Ford Pinellas Board to ask Pinellas County, and this is kind of awkward, to consider removing the signs because uh, the person who uh, brought this motion feels that there are a lot of people who might ordinarily ride their bike out to Honeyman Island State Park who are not doing it because it's a fairly long bridge. Uh, it, it does, if you end up walking your bike all the way over that bridge, it adds a lot of travel time and it is a disincentive. And if you're forced to get out in traffic and ride, that's another disincentive for folks. And it's gonna be a few years before we have a new bridge out there. Um, so this is a problem that's gonna be around for a few years. Uh, so we don't like to be in a position of asking this board to direct one local government to do something different. But this was a direction, a, a unanimous resolution from the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee. And, um, you know, it's, it's asking for us to work with the county to reconsider whether the signs ordering the bicyclist to dismount are necessary and to reevaluate the situation, including some other signs or other alternatives out there. And Kyle, if I got any of that wrong, please come up and correct the record, or did that get it pretty close? Okay. And I want to give respect to our, our board member, um, Ron Englert, uh, on the BPAC. Uh, he's been tenacious on this issue. Um, and, um, and I also want to give kudos to the county who's done their best to be accommodating and responding while trying to be consistent in how they approach this. So I'm just making you aware of the issue. Yes. Um, thank you. What? I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna give an opinion, but I will tell you that I hear on both sides of the fence on this one. I have people I personally know that have been mowed down by bikes on that bridge. People have their earbuds in. They can't hear. Bike comes, says, you know, here or there, yells, can't hear it, boom, they crash. So I don't know what the right answer is, but what I would like is some kind of um, uh, coordination with the city of Dunedin before a recommendation is made. I think getting our people involved, I think, you know, maybe getting those cameras from Honeymoon Island that look out to see how many bikes do we have going in there. For those who don't know, the Dunedin Causeway is, is part of the Pinellas Trail. So yes, there is a lot of bike riding and there is a ton of walking. And the conflict is very real with the walkers and the bikers. And I'm not trying to take a side for one or the other, but there have definitely been injuries because of it. Um, but I think there has to be a more coordinated effort maybe um, to bring Dunedin and maybe some of Dunedin's committees into the fold as well before we ask the county. Because yeah. I, I mean, I do, and I, I'm sure my elected officials would agree that they hear it too. Fair. Dave's a big walker of the trail. He might have some insight. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I, I totally agree. I think we ought to have an opportunity with City of Dunedin that incorporates a lot of the users um, to see, just to get some feedback, uh, get some resident feedback. I certainly think, and I've always, you know, I've always thought this that, you know, pedestrians have the, you know, this is why I've had differences with the county on their change on how they manage the the, the traffic on the trails because now we're putting walkers and bikers together on one side and bikers and walkers together on the other, which just doesn't, doesn't make any sense. But I certainly would, if, if you take that sign down, there needs to be a sign that says pedestrians have priority or something along those yeah. lines because it, the bicyclists need to understand that, okay, I've got to be on the lookout because they have the priority. Now, there's nobody there. I could just fly right through. Why should I have to get off the bike, you know? I get that part too. But if there's something on there that says 
pedestrians have priority, then at least everybody's on notice that I see people, I better get off at least part of it. And then yeah. when they're gone, I can get back on it and, and go. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think something like that makes a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, I would let the city of Dunedin weigh sure. in and see what, see what the folks that live there have to say. Absent any other direction? Yes, go ahead. Thanks, Whit. So the, so the signs to dismount, that's not on the, uh, not on the cart lane side, but that's in the, in the sidewalk side? Yeah, and okay. the, the county has moved those signs a little bit. Um, before they were in, in a different location that didn't make it easy to make, to make a decision to get in the travel lane. So they've moved them back to where now you can go over to the travel lane. Okay. But it's pretty far away from where you get to the pinch point. Right. So if you start walking where the sign is, yeah. then it's gonna be a hike. And if you're dragging a 65 or 75 pound e-bike, that's tough on people. That, that's one of the concerns. If you do as I do, uh, and you ride until you get to a pedestrian, and then you dismount, it's a little easier, but then you're technically in violation of what the sign says. So it, th that's part of the dis debate we're having. Yeah, I, I actually always thought those signs were just simply because the metal grates can be a little slick. They can be. Um, but I, I, I mean, I've ridden over that causeway lots of times, and, and I never go into the sidewalk side of it simply because it's too crowded. And I just stay in the, I mean, it ticks cars off, but. I actually feel that that's safer for me than being in the, in the other side. But the county did just install, probably within the last 10 days, um, I don't know if you can see this, but temporary signs at the base of the causeway. Yeah. yeah. Say, you know, you know, so that's, that's up there now. So that, that may help alleviate the situation a little bit. But, but I think those signs are for um, entry into the Honeymoon Island. It well, can they've, be used they've, for well, any number of things, but... They've modified the signs to yeah. also say bike sharing the road. They say yeah. bicycles may use full lane, yeah. Yeah. is what, what it says. So. And they've painted shared lane markings uh, yeah. out there, too. Yeah. What's the speed limit on the car? 35. 35, 35 Kyle, is that right? 35. 35. Yeah. And nobody really drives 35. No. no. <laughs> I mean, I've had... Depends some, what time yeah. of day. If it's nighttime, they're going fast. If it's day, they're crawling. Right. It really does. So I, what I'm hearing is that we'll work with the city of Dunedin and the county to work through this solution a little bit further and um, yeah. see if we can bring something back that everybody can live with. I'll keep you updated. Thank you. Okay. Want me to go on to legislative? Yes, please. Okay. I could spend another hour talking about legislative. I won't do it. Um, let me highlight one thing and then I'll move into a few bills. Um, I did get a request from um, uh, an executive vice president at Brightline uh, to support their legislative earmark request for $50 million that's been filed by a Hillsborough County commissioner, I can't remember, uh, Rep. Gonzalez, I think, um, that will help address getting Brightline from Orlando International Airport to Tampa International <coughs> Airport. It deals with... Um, a bridge project in Osceola and Polk County. Um, what I'm seeking is board uh, consensus or support uh, to send a letter saying we support having Brightline come to Tampa, but I don't want to be on record supporting a legislative earmark because we've kind of been on the no earmarks bandwagon for a few years, and I think it would be um, hypocrisy and not a good look for us. But getting Brightline here, the $50 million earmark sounds like a lot of money. I was told by that Brightline executive it will cost $8 billion to get Brightline to Tampa. Um, so there's a lot more to be done, um, but the earmark certainly helps. But I think if we could go on record as a board saying we are very supportive of having Brightline higher speed rail come from Orlando to Tampa, I think that would send a good message. Yeah. So my understanding was that the model for Brightline was that, I mean, again, if there's a particular bridge that is really driving the price and you need to, that's a different issue. But the model that Brightline uses is that they front the cost for the rail um, along the right-of-way that's provided, but that they get development rights around the, mm -hmm. the, the, the centers. That's right. And, that, and that's the trade-off. So, the, so the, the rail is a loss leader, 
and then you develop the heck out of those stations, and that's how they make their money. Mm -hmm. So for them to ask for money for the route now, uh, unless it's a particular like crossing of the Mississippi River or something like your, this is unusual. So we need a little help with that. I just don't. I'm uncomfortable. Like like you said, going in that direction. Yeah. Um, I think you're right about the model in general, but I also think that their approach and business plan has changed a little bit since the initial concept. For instance, the state of Florida contributed several hundred million dollars to the station at the, Met, at the Orlando International Airport for Brightline. But it also accommodates some other things too. But that was yeah. definitely public investment. So it's become more of a hybrid than originally envisioned. Okay. But you're right, land development is mainly a... We support the service, but not the legislative earmark request. Is that generally okay with this board? Mm -hmm. Go with me. Yeah. Yep. Okay, the next thing I wanna highlight is, um, and I'm just gonna highlight one bill. In your packet, um, you have, as of whenever the date was, it was probably early February, February 7th, a summary of some bills, and I have an updated version that Linda gave me today. The, the, the biggest bill that affects this board right now is Senate Bill 1032 and House Bill 7049, which would fundamentally um, influence how MPOs operate in the state of Florida. And uh, I just want to highlight two big concerns. The, the main concern, and I think you see this with our transportation safety performance measures, uh, the, this bill would require us to every year post on our website uh, a series of performance quality metrics for transportation that will be defined by the Florida <laughs> Department of Transportation for us uh, that will measure quality. And the bill says that shall include traffic congestion and utilization of facilities. And I've got no problem in general with <laughs> addressing traffic congestion or utilization of facilities However, um, doing that annually, given the pace that Commissioner Long uh, pointed out about getting things done, it takes seven to 10 years to get a transportation project from concept to construction. What are we gonna show year to year to year in terms of change? Uh, it is uh, an unfunded mandate because we're fully federally funded and here's the state telling us we've gotta spend time doing these annual performance metrics. And then solving traffic congestion is something we'd like to do, but it's out of our control a lot of times. It's dependent on growth, it's dependent on land use decisions, it's dependent on regional growth, it's dependent on all those tourists who come here. And we're and in a- And it's dependent on how much we invest in actual transportation improvements. And how much we invest outside of what the MPO can control, because that takes local, it takes state, it takes federal, and we can control two of those three. Um, so it just puts us in a real pickle to, to do that. The other thing that's really egregious about this bill is it says we have to submit our long range plan to the state to determine whether it's in congruence with the metropolitan area. And that's our responsibility. That's the federal, that's what the federal government created MPOs to do. So it's a cooperative planning process. It's not a big daddy and little, little baby relationship. Uh, we are equals when it comes to solving transportation problem. And I respect the heck of our Florida DOT partners, but our plan is our plan. It reflects the local communities and it is a plan required by the Federal Highway Administration. So we, we need to kind of move away from, is our plan okay, DOT, can we move forward to here's our plan, now let's work together to, to solve the problems in it. Um, so I hope this bill gets amended. Um, it's making some progress. Uh, lately, it seems to be a little stalled. We've conveyed these concerns to Senator DeSegli, Senator Hooper, and to our entire delegation, um, but um, I'm not sure how much they're listening. Um, the other concern about utilization of facilities is that a lot of times transportation facilities are put in place for safety, and we want everybody to use them, we want them to be highly utilized, but I don't have the ability to go out and count everybody using a sidewalk that we build. Or we just put in a bike lane on State Road 590 up in Safety Harbor as part of a resurfacing project. You know, it'd be really burdensome to go out and count all the people who are using that bike lane. How many days of the week do we count? 
How, how many weekends do we count? That's an enormous waste of effort, in my opinion. So um, nobody wants to build a, a facility that nobody uses, but at the same time, it's gonna be um, a measurement nightmare. So just a heads up about that. Um, there are other bills of concern that I'll mention uh, in here. Um, Senator Hooper's bill on transportation that would um, cap the amount of money that can go to public transit uh, is still moving forward. Um, there's a bill that would um, take any money reserved for um, match with federal funds for transit and sweep that into the strategic and modal system if it's not used in any given year. Um, we have a bill concerning um, um, alternative mobility funding systems, the transportation impact fee that Jared mentioned, that um, we'll have to see how that one plays out, that could limit the county or a city collecting a fee and sending dollars to the other entity, which is how we set it up today. So we'll have to um, bill that in. There is a Live Local Act uh, refinement um, for affordable housing uh, that um, does um, relax some of the density requirements. At one point, they took out the industrial land provision, but now it's been put back in. Um, so uh, just pay attention to that one. Uh, we had a bill on virtual meetings that would allow advisory committees to have virtual meetings without having a physical quorum present, but then that bill was amended to only apply to the National Estuary Program. Uh, that may be something we want to consider when we um, uh, look at a regional MPO. Maybe we can have a carve out for a regional MPO. Um, and then there's a bill on violations against vulnerable road users that actually got out of two committees or three committees for the first time ever, but it has not yet been scheduled in its final committee stops. And then Senator Perry had a bill about our rectangular rapid flashing beacons that we've successfully fought a few years. Uh, this would require those all be removed if they can't be um, interconnected with an adjacent traffic signal, and that's just not what they do. So you would effectively have to remove all your flashing beacons. Fortunately, that bill is not advancing. And I'm depressed talking about all these bills already. Um, so I just give you that update. If there's anything specific you want me to focus on or have questions about, I'll do my best. And Linda Fishers and our staff who put all this together, and she's done a great job keeping track. Sounds like you're ready for me to move on. Yeah. <laughs> all right, um, let's see, what's next? Drew Street, okay, this is another fun one. So um, in your handout at your table, you have a summary that the Florida Department of Transportation provided to the city of Clearwater. Uh, it's public record, so I just share it with you. Um, the department is nearing completion of an updated traffic study that was mandated by the legislature in passing the last budget. So there's some budget proviso language in there. Uh, we know this has now become a campaign issue for the Clearwater City election. Um, I won't rehash the history of Drew Street, but this, this is a City of Clearwater requested project. And um, we have put it on the priority list as a result of their request. We have funding lined up uh, in the work program. It's been pushed out a little bit pending the completion of this study. So what we're gonna do um, in consultation with the Florida Department of Transportation, we're gonna wait for the city uh, election results and see the new council uh, seated. And then we are going to meet one-on-one -on -one, uh, with the uh, newly elected officials and inform them of the findings, the rationale, the basis for the, for the plan for Drew Street, um, and then um, see what additional questions and, and if there's additional analysis that needs to be performed, then so be it. Ultimately, if the city of Clearwater decides they no longer support this project, don't have a majority for it, um, I've had some discussions with FDOT and they're gonna work with us to try and keep those funds in Pinellas County. Um, so we may be looking at a plan B for where to shift those dollars to. And I don't have that plan B yet, but I will soon. I'm hoping we can keep the project on pace in the city of Clearwater, but that's gonna be up to the city of Clearwater. And um, frankly, in good conscience, if the, clear, if the city, the host city, even though it's a state road, no longer supports the project, it's gonna be really difficult for us to sit up here and insist that this project go forward. It's gonna be really hard for the Florida Department of Transportation to, to do that same thing. So um, we'll just see how we, how we proceed, and I just wanted to give you that update. Um, we'll take our lead from the city of Clearwater on this one. Any questions about Drew Street? I have a suggested project. 
Pardon me? I have a suggested project. Oh, you do, do you? Uh, Belcher and State Road 60. <laughs> David? I need a few more hundred million dollars. <laughs> well, it's a start. Commissioner Rogers. Mike, please. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I got it tw twice. Um, so they've done the study with the five new um, facilities along the, the roadway to see how the, the traffic is generated. It says, collected the new traffic counts as requested, updated the build and no build traffic. For so they've done all this work. And then they said, once we have concurrence from the city of Clearwater on the traffic forecast, the lane repurposing study will be updated and resubmitted to the lane repurp. I, so, so I'm not sure I get any of that. So are they just being, are we be, just being political here? Um, or is there a statement that says that the, 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 the model that was created um, with, without consideration of those is no, not really significantly different than with those? That's right. Okay. But they don't say that here. Who's the, it, did we do this or did? This, this, I, the state did this study. F, F, at the yes, with their consultants at the request of the, uh, the legislature. So there's folks that are weighing in politically that's putting pressure on FDOT to respond this way? Yes, that budget proviso language was inserted into the budget by um, Senator Hooper okay. at the request of, of somebody. Okay. Um, I mean, I, certainly I understand the, the, there's the, you know, the, the, there's certain folks that say about the, the strain, the, the lane reduction, street lane reduction, as it relates to transit. Okay, I, I can understand that one a little bit more. This has never been transit driven. This has been safety driven. Correct. Um, and so, I mean, do we have numbers on this street on, on the safety issues that we've had? We uh, do. Accidents and fatalities yes. and, and uh, you can't even count the number of near misses. If you sneeze while you're driving and turn left, you're likely to be in, over that double line in a second because the lanes are so narrow. I just wonder whether we shouldn't pull that information out again. I mean, I, it, 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 is the FDOT, when they do this, did they put that information in that, that says, this was the mo the, the reason we're doing this is for safety and deaths yes. and... Yeah, that, that first bullet point, total number of crashes are expected to decrease by 57%. They've looked at the safety data, we've looked at the safety data. I think we counted more than 500 crashes between Keene and Osceola over a five-year period? Three fatalities? I haven't looked at it since we did it, but that was 2021, 2016 through 21. And how does that differ from the next phase of, of, of Drew Street? I mean, maybe there's a comparison. What do you mean the next phase of well, Drew Street? Well, no, no, I'm sorry. The next section of Drew Street going to the east. Oh, from you know, Keene to yeah, US maybe 19? Keene to the to to you know Sunset Point or Northeast Coachman or something. I'd, there, ha I'd have to go back and look at the data. I think it's more concentrated west of Keene. The yeah. the crashes. Yeah. You probably have more severe crashes when you get around the US 19 area because speeds are a little speed, higher. Yeah. Um, the project goes from Osceola to US 19, so there is a resurfacing for the whole road. The lane repurposing is that short stretch from Keene West to Osceola through the neighborhood, uh, not the commercial area, but the residential area. So um, there's a, it's basically a resurfacing with some modest safety improvements to the east. To the west. Uh, to the east, to US 19. And to the west is the lane repurposing. Oh, okay, yeah. <coughs> Commissioner Albright. Okay, just to be, just to clear this up a little bit, uh, this project was moving forward until the business community, basically, through the chamber, decided they couldn't get out of town fast enough, and um, they tried to put the brakes on it. So uh, it is a political issue now because a lot of the people running for council are trying to get votes from the business community by saying, yeah, you know, that's probably not a good idea, but 
you know, to me, safety trumps everything. And it's not been a couple of years that, that we've known that we've had a problem in that area. It's been a long time, 20 years probably. Uh, I'd like to really get the data on the crashes and the deaths because people question that. They go, oh, they, we haven't had that many. Well, I know we've had a lot of them. And the neighbors are screaming over there for some kind of something to be done. We can't buy up any more property to make the street wider. So the three lane is the best way to go. We've, every, everybody is on board with slowing down traffic there. And I, DOT will not do it when there's four lanes, but if there's three lanes, we can drop it to 30 miles an hour. And I think, that's not DOT's area, is it? That is, that, that lane reduction area is DOT. Oh, yeah. that's, all, that's all state road. Oh, yeah. they were, well, there's, a, there's a short segment that city maintained when you get west of Myrtle. So safety is important. So slowing down is an option or isn't an option? It is. It okay. is. That's but, in the plan. I understand, but yeah. I mean, I'm talking about now. Slowing they won't it down. do I mean, it. It's just We've crazy. asked them to slow it down. Yeah. They can't because they say it's four lanes and our, we can't slow, they've slowed it down I think to 35 in one area yeah. and they have a flashing thing to tell people they're speeding but people do 50 and 55 miles an hour in the, uh, in the 40 mile an hour zone so. Okay. Yeah, I, we'll think I think the most important out. thing is is that Witt said here's an update. We don't really want to talk about it until the election's over. <laughs> but we're sitting here talking about it to a great extent. So I think you're trying not to say a lot until the election's uh, over. I think my message is Ford Pinellas is waiting for the city of Clearwater to decide what it wants to do. Yeah. And that's, it's important that they get to decide what they want to do with the newly elected city council members. Is that clear to everybody? Yeah. Okay, thank clear you. <laughs> no, not clear as mud, clear, clear, clear. Uh, the only other thing I have is information items, the MPO Weekend Institute. If you have signed up, thank you very much. If you have not, um, please consider if you'd like to do this. Hopefully it won't be the last one forever because that bill that I talked about abolishes the MPO Advisory Council. Wait, if it's all right, I wanna update the board on a correction to the agenda on upcoming events. We showed target enforcement day on the Pinellas Trail was to happen this Saturday. And while we've been meeting today, a decision was made to cancel that due to weather and it's gonna be rescheduled either March 9th or April 6th. Kyle, is April 6th definite yet? But due to the weather, we're not gonna do the targeted enforcement on the trail. Welcome back, Blue Jays Day. <laughs> and golf cart parade, it's gonna rain? Don't shoot the <laughs> no, it wasn't who I was gonna shoot. All right, does anybody have anything else for the good of the order here? Welcome back, it's Saturday. Opening day is the following. Anybody? No? Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Thank you for being here and happy Valentine's Day. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.